Hello everybody, my name is Michael Harkey. I'm the curator of code here at Infotex and your moderator. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them as you see pictured here. We will make sure they get answered. We'd like to point out destinations on our website, webinars.infotex.com, where you can find our upcoming webinar topics and event schedule. And then also movies.infotex.com, where you can find the movies of these webinars and training videos. We welcome your feedback and would love to hear how we are doing or topics you wish for us to cover. Please fill out our quick evaluation or drop us an email. And now for some legal disclaimers. Lene? When you view an Infotex webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you're agreeing to the terms posted at the web page listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the web page listed in this slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the web page shown on this slide. Today's webinar is about technology planning and it leverages a tactical plan alternative analysis that Dan creates at the end of every cybersecurity conference hosted by the Indiana Bankers Association. I'm going to quickly go out to our blog site so you can see where our webinar schedule and movies are located in the form of final deliverables. For our webinar schedule, webinars.infotex.com will resolve to this page. It has our upcoming schedule of events and webinars. To watch pre-recorded webinars, simply go to movies.infotex.com. Meanwhile, you'll be able to find the documents you need at the link you see here. Which brings me to the speaker for today's event. The drum roll, please. Thank you. The man with 13 letters after his name, the cyber changeling from Chicago, the bringer of policy and breaker of tech, the poet from We Know It, the awareness guru from Indiana, Dan Hathaway. Dan? Well, thanks a lot, Michael, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us again. Um, it's time again for our technology planning webinar. Uh, the globe has gone all the way around the sun. And uh, it's another October, uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and time for us to start looking at updating our tactical plans for 2020. But first, I'd like to do a shout out. This is my annual shout out to the Indiana Bankers Association, as well as the Community Bankers Association of Ohio. They uh, produced the Cyber Fraud and Security Conference. And uh, I felt like it went really well. As uh, most of you know, the big deliverable from it, for me at least, is that I make a list of all the action items as I'm watching all the talks. And we're going to be talking today about how you can consider them and analyze them as part of your technology planning process. Uh, but first, I'd like to say that uh, Joe and Jane Iso um, did not make it home from the conference yet. Um, I guess there was some car troubles. Uh, Jane isn't too impressed with Joe's um, auto mechanic skills, I can see there. I guess you could say that um, their strategy was to get home, and uh, I think they're struggling changing their tactics. But 
Today, we're actually going to review the prerequisites again. Um, and by the way, those of you who hate Dan's spreadsheets, I mean, we're really talking about a spreadsheet approach to tactical planning here. So I know that a lot of you are dialing in because you want that new spreadsheet from the conferences that we have visited over the last three or four uh, months here. So uh, we'll be you know, going over those prerequisites, um, I'm going to kind of do a real quick review of the guidance, but I want to make sure that we also kind of remind ourselves of what the guidance is. I'm hearing that FDIC examiners and OCC examiners, at least in the Indiana and Ohio area, are starting to ask questions about technology planning, tactical planning, that sort of thing. And then finally, we'll go into the tactical analysis or, or what I call the tactical plan alternatives. Um, which is a spreadsheet that I'm making available as part of this webinar so that you can see, first of all, the action items from the conference and, and prioritize them into your 2020 tactical plan. So let's get started. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, the prerequisites really to be able to get through this webinar, um, you should have already seen our technology planning webinars in the past. And really, um, the webinar that uh, we did in 2016 would be sufficient for you to watch. If you haven't seen our technology planning webinars yet, um, you should probably go watch this movie. Uh, the movie really kind of, you know, positions that... Uh, you know, we're all universal travelers, and so using a book called The Universal Traveler, uh, we talk about planning as a creative design process. Um, that movie really goes into who, what, when, where, and hows. You know, the fact that we need a multidisciplinary approach to planning is something that should not be a surprise to community-based bankers. We're kind of wanting a multidisciplinary approach to almost everything anymore, right? Uh, but then also, you know, it talks about uh, what we call a top-down, bottom-up approach, um, policy and procedure implications, and then technology planning as a journey. But we can, by way of summary, reduce the movie into three main takeaways, which is technology planning is really a management awareness process for strategy alignment. Um, if you remember that definition of IT governance, it's really technology risk management plus return on investment which we make sure we get a return on investment in technology by aligning our IT plans to the strategy of the bank or the mission of the bank or the bank's tactical plan if the bank happens to have one. Now, that's obviously a lot easier said than done because bank business planning is something that's a little bit above our pay grades, but hopefully we can at least coax a list of what does the bank as a whole want to do in the next three to five years, you know, what would we our first steps be in 2020? Because we want our technology plan to facilitate what the bank needs. We call that strategy alignment. Meanwhile, we want to take a top-down, bottom-up approach. And so what we mean by that is that we're going to apply a framework, an approach that says, hey, um, we're going to create a vision, we're going to create a strategy, we're going to create a tactical plan. If we're a bigger bank, maybe we might even have an IT operations plan. And then we also, the movie is, you know, kind of drills down a little bit further on what we're talking about here to say that it's really about the establishment of three lists. And so the deliverables from a technology planning process, at least as we see it at Infotex for smaller community-based banks is that we should establish two to four statements that say this is what our vision is for technology at the bank. And so the vision statement is something that really spans a three to five year, maybe even longer time frame. It's more of a, of a statement that this is what we are, you know, so maybe we're competitive, maybe we're early adapters, maybe we're um, reliable, maybe we're um, um, you know, I mean, uh, cutting edge, maybe we're late adapters, you know, whatever our vision is for technology, we want to try to articulate that in two to four statements. Then meanwhile, the second list then would be a list of five to eight strategy statements that, that are basically saying, all right, 
Well, based on what our vision is and based on what the bank's business plan is and based on what we know we need to do now and based on what our current environment is, here's our strategy for the next year. And usually, you know, we can accomplish that in five to eight statements, which then are executed by completing a tactical plan. We're, we're, we're saying try to keep our tactical plan to less than 25 different tactics. Now, when we review the guidance, by the way, we're going to learn that the FFIEC would actually like us to go a step further than this. So let's review that guidance. Okay, so what we'd like to do next is just kind of take a quick review of the guidance that's available to us currently in October 2019 uh, that we found on FFIEC.gov. So when you unzip the zip that's on the web page that we're providing a link to, this is what you're going to find is that Infotex, whenever we, you know, want to get our arms around guidance, we have a process in place now. We will actually go out to the FFIEC's website, um, FFIEC.gov, and uh, we will bring together all the information about a particular subject. In this case, it's about technology planning, and it, it was as of October 7, 2019. And so what we found out there is, First of all, the management IT booklet is where most of what we talk about when we talk about technology planning is, is kept. Um, there's also a specific section on IT resources. And then, of course, there's a section on budgeting, uh, which, of course, your CFO might want to take a look at. And so... What we're encouraging you to do is to, when you download that zip file, you know, pass this around to the people that might be involved in your technology planning process so that they understand what the guidance requires. Now, what I'm going to do right now is just kind of quickly reduce the guidance to a nine-point audit checklist, right? And so, um, first of all, uh, let's just kind of talk about what the FFIEC says about planning. And, and, and first of all, they define planning. And, and they basically say that technology planning is preparing for future activities by defining goals. And so if any of you have watched our change management movie, you will see that we use change management to help us track our goals. And so the technology pro planning process is a process to help us decide what those goals should be. All right, once we decide what the goals should be, we can then move them into our change management program, which already has a formal review process, you know, a meeting structure that can be leveraged for further defining each tactic in terms of the goals that would be required to implement the tactic. And so once the guidance is finished defining what they mean by technology planning, um, then it starts to go into what technology planning requires, which really is four different factors. Um, a, uh, they want what we would call a bottom-up approach where senior management participates. Uh, we believe that, by the way, it should be department heads, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, they want to establish the role of IT, which should be a supportive, not an authoritative uh, role. In other words, IT really shouldn't do the planning. IT should support the planning. And one of the things IT will need to do is to help the planning team understand the impact of their plans on the existing IT infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, there needs to be some kind of an accurate scorecard on past performance, which is a you know, a powerful little group of words there. And really, 
what we're kind of saying there is that, you know, once again, we need to have some method of monitoring the plan. Um, it requires management involvement, right? And um, the guidance itself actually suggests that we use the IT steering committee as the planning group, and that's a good idea. We agree with that, but the input into the plan, when we talk about management involvement in that case, uh, we want to get department heads who might not be on the IT steering committee to input as well. And so really we feel like we should open input to any department head or, or any senior management person willing to submit a wish list, right? Um, now, this here is more my own interpretation of the guidance than um, it actually is the guidance. Um, you know, the, the guidance basically says there should be, um, well, that the plan should achieve a process that constantly adjusts. And boy, do I agree with that. Um, and because of that, we'll be talking later in this webinar about placeholders. Uh, but then also, we feel like we need to regularly go over something. Um, we, we wonder if it should just be the final tactic, certainly not all the alternative tactics that you use in trying to decide what your final tactics are going to be. But more importantly, we should review the goals that we've decided we need to achieve in order to execute those tactics. And once again, that's the change management program where we actually review the goals. Unless you're a larger bank, and I'll be getting that to that when we talk about the IT operations plan. So what I really want to stress, though, is that technology planning, what this webinar is about, is defining goals, whereas change management is where we encourage our smaller community-based banks to track the achievement of the goals that are defined in the technology planning process. And so this is just one bullet point. I just kind of drilled down on the, you know, we need a process that constantly adjusts. Uh, management changes their mind on what they want, right? Or they go to a conference and they come back with new ideas. So the other aspects, though, of what the guidance drills down on when they say it, we need a, um, a, a process that has management involvement is they also discuss how the board needs to be a challenge to the plan. And so, you know, to us, what we're basically saying there is a, maybe a good way of looking at this is when we talk to the board about their role in cybersecurity, we, we reduce it down to you should, you should always remember to ask one question, which is how does this protect our customers, right? And so to get an IT audit report, how does this protect our customers? Well, a very different but similar approach could be taken to the board's role in technology planning, which really is to look at the tactical plan or anytime the CIO or whoever brings up a technology plan, the board's role could be to challenge that person and ask, how does this help us achieve the current strategy of the bank at large? Because that's what the technology plan is supposed to do, at least at a high level. Um, finally, the guidance also wants us to make sure that we consider how vendors are impacted not only with new services, are we duplicating services, that sort of thing, um, but also do we need to retire certain services? Do we need to, you know, um, work on a vendor's performance? Do we need to bring in new vendors because of new tactics in our technology plan? And the plan itself then, the guidance goes on to say, should address long-term business goals, you know, align IT to the business goals of the bank. They're actually suggesting a three- to five-year horizon before you drop your pencil. I mean, at a strategic level, our strategy statements might not change that much from year to year. It's our tactical plan that we should really focus in on the next year's worth of specific steps and and the personnel and the vendors we would need to achieve those steps, and, and then what tools are we going to need to acquire in order to be able to achieve each of those tactics. And again, the change management program can be used for that. Well, 
The guidance also establishes that there needs to be an operational IT plan. In other words, a plan to achieve each tactic that we've identified as part of our technology plan for the current year, which now would be 2020, right? And so what this is saying is that if we come up with, you know, 25 statements is what I originally suggested, but let's say it's, you know, a busy year, we're going to acquire a few branches or whatever, 50 statements, 75 statements. This is saying that we want to adopt a plan to achieve each tactic. Well, we think this can be done organically in meeting structures using the change management program. So if you're wondering whether you need to comply with this part of guidance, I feel like, and by the way, this is not, I don't know if you noticed, but our little FFIEC on the bottom went away. This is not guidance. This is my interpretation. Uh, but I'm really feeling like this is an overkill for community-based banks. Um, the OCC, by the way, may disagree with me. But the point being that I guess I'm trying to make is that what we really want to do is we want to have a meeting structure um, where we're monitoring the uh, um, progress on goals meant to achieve the tactics. And so if you watch our change management movie, you'll see how, you know, any goal in the change management program should relate back to a strategy or a tactic or even a vision statement, et cetera, et cetera. And so where we're heading with this, and again, this is my interpretation of the guidance, not the guidance itself, but we're heading to where if the goal is to align technology with the business plan, then we're going to create IT strategy statements, and then we're going to identify which tactics out of everything we could do, we're actually going to commit to for the year 2020, and then we're going to design goals that will help us achieve each tactic. And again, if you watched our change management movie, you would uh, find a way we propose to achieve that last step uh, with, you know, without having to actually bog your whole management team down with a whole bunch of paperwork nobody's going to read, blah, blah, blah. So... Uh, but you need to have a list of what the bank's trying to accomplish over the course of the next year. And then that list will guide the creation of your own IT strategy that then should be executed through the use of a tactical plan. And what we really mean by that, by the way, is that each tactic we decide to implement should relate to a strategy statement. And so let's just say that we're in a really decent place where we only have to have two strategy statements. One is keep things safe. The other one is no more new products and services. Well, let's just say that that's our strategy. Well, then the tactic of implementing peer-to-peer -peer mobile banking would not really be a good tactic because the strategy says no more new products and services, right? And so that's what we really mean by making sure that the tactic implements the strategy. The tactic has to relate to a strategy. And we'll show you how that works when we get to the next section. But before we go there, I just want to remind you that the guidance has a list of many different factors that should be considered while you're judging what tactics to implement. These factors, on the other hand, and again, they're in that guidance, they really are what we talk about when we sit down and have our conversation with the IT Steering Committee around the tactical alternatives that we've prioritized based on cost based on customer impact, and that sort of thing. And I'll explain that to you when I get to reviewing the spreadsheet with you again. But what I'd like to do now is to just kind of like to go over with you the nine-point audit list that your auditors are probably going to be asking you questions about once they get around to analyzing how well you're doing when it comes to technology planning. And so A, is senior management participating? Now, the guidance itself says the IT steering committee is sufficient. So if you have an IT steering committee in place, good for you. We can just keep it to the IT steering committee. Now, having said that, it would be foolish, in my opinion, if you have a situation where nobody from the loan department's on your IT steering committee to just assume that the loan department doesn't need anything. So that's the bottom-up approach that we're talking about. Management should... Clarify the role of IT. Or, you know, does IT develop the, you know, the technology plan and then just get the IT steering committee to rubber stamp it? 
or does IT facilitate the management team's decision on what the technology plan is going to be? What is the impact on and of the IT infrastructure? So, you know, if we decide we're going to bring in a huge widget that requires a gigabyte connection to the internet and all we have is a you know, DSL connection to the internet, well, guess what? We're going to have to improve the infrastructure before we bring in the big widget. Um, the next one, just so you know, we'll be asking community-based banks, how do you know how well you've performed against your technology plan? And then we'll kind of listen to what you say, and we're kind of expecting there to be some kind of an organic process. Um, if I was an auditor and, and, and one of my audit clients said, well, you know, we don't really keep a scorecard. I sure hope you're not asking for that. But what we do is in every IT steering committee meeting, we bring up our tactical plan and, and everybody's kind of gone over it in advance and identified where we're falling behind and, and what percent completion we have done. And that's kind of how we're managing, you know, the performance against the IT plan. We would consider that to be sufficient, even though it isn't a fancy dancy scorecard that maybe the big banks have the time uh, to put together. Um, but the specific objective measures that we're using would include budget. Did we, did we deliver on what we said the cost was going to be or, you know, come in under that? Um, it would include a deadline. You know, did we get it done on time? And it would probably include how many of the tactics were we able to implement this year. And for those that we didn't get fully done, why? And do we need to add them to next year's tactical plan? You know, et cetera, et cetera. The fifth audit checklist item then is, did you start with a business plan, right? Did you get the management team to give you a, a business plan on the bank? If the bank isn't doing business planning, did we get the management team to give us a 10-point list of what the bank wants to accomplish in the next year, et cetera, et cetera? And then, you know, if the bank wants to open two locations and there's 25 tactics but not one of them says facilitate the opening of the next two locations, then we would say, hey, you know what? You're not really aligning your IT strategic plan with your business strategy. Make sense? The point number seven, ensuring the IT department is delivering on time within budget and to specification, I kind of already went over that. Um, balancing investments between systems. You know, we want to make sure that we didn't go out and get the gigabyte internet connection and therefore we had no more money left to buy the widget that needed the gigabyte internet connection are we focusing our decisions on the business objectives or are we focusing focusing them on something else you know we're going to be again going over a 68 point list that came from the conference your job is to say what of this applies to our business objectives if anything you know and and by the way the 68 point list should be augmented or supplemented or you know added to by the wish list that's coming from each of your department heads. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to take, you might end up with a list of 120 tactical plan alternatives that we then try to reduce down to the 35 tactics that we're going to try to achieve in 2020. So that's the guidance. That's kind of our summary of uh, what you should be aware of as you start the tactical analysis, which is really the process of deciding what should our goals be that we can then use our change management system to track. Okay, so now's when we're gonna be pulling up that spreadsheet, right? And so before we kind of bring that up, I just wanna kind of bring up a few reminders that, that the tactical analysis is kind of where you lay the paper trail. Um, this, this is not your tactical plan. Your tactical plan will actually be a Word document that summarizes the results of your tactical analysis. So let me explain what I mean by that real quick. So, of course, we have a policy language in case you want to require a technology planning process by policy. Um, this could be inserted into your information security program or your IT governance policy, risk management policy, wherever you feel like it's most appropriate to call for a framework at least for technology planning and making sure that we're aligning strategy to you know our plans 
And then finally, there is the actual, you know, boilerplate for the strategy and the boilerplate for the tactical plan. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, it's just basically a narrative of the tactics that you're going to use to implement each of the strategy statements. So you'll see here, you know, there's two, you know, each of these are strategy statements that um, have tactics that we've decided upon, you know, based on our tactical analysis. And so what I'd like to do, you know, next then is to dive into that tactical analysis. But before I do, also know that when it's time to pull together the budget, which, you know, is a part of the, te you know, technology planning process, this tactical analysis will also be the paper trail for at least your initial decisions, your initial estimates, ballpark estimates is usually what we encourage people to use or, you know, go out and get one quote and use that as a worst case scenario. Um, but hopefully once you've decided upon your tactics, we don't, we don't want to develop a budget for all 68 statements, but if we decide, hey, these are the 25 we're going to commit to, now we need to get serious about the budget. The tactical analysis is a paper trail that you can use to say, this is why I came up with what I came up with for the budget for the big widget and the budget for the gigabyte internet connection. It's also the paper trail that proves you considered all of management's input. And you'll see that we've got some prioritization metrics in this paper trail so it's easier for you to look at the department head whose proposed widget didn't get implemented and say, well, sorry, we couldn't implement in 2020, maybe in a future year, but here's why. See my paper trail here? It's a pretty tactical analysis. It's really the paper trail for why we did not do what we did not do as much as it is the queue up of the Word document that says, here's what we are going to do. So let's go out and take a look at the tactical plan alternative spreadsheet that we prepared for you. But what I'm really wanting to talk about now is in this folder then, the tactical plan alternatives. Uh, let's kind of make it easy for you to see what we've got here. And so we've been doing this webinar, at least in this format, um, since 2017. Uh, this really is a list of alternative new tactics that we could consider in our next technology planning exercise that are based on the conferences that we've attended over the last few months. And so it's important for you to realize that when you see this spreadsheet, you're going to see the power of that IBA cybersecurity conference because um, if it came from a different conference, we're just calling it, hey, Infotech's basic controls that we picked up along the way as we were, you know, at various places. But that cybersecurity conference delivers so many action items that it has its own category. So when you open up the Tactical Plan Alternatives folder, you'll find these three files. Um, and so we have one for 2017, one for 2018. Um, this webinar, of course, is centered around 2019 and so let's just open that um, what you'll find is you know like all of our boilerplates we start off with this uh, um, it's a tab and a spreadsheet but in our word boilerplates right it's just the first page of the boilerplate but the point being is that it's a transfer of copyright agreement it really refers out to our website um, it's important that you understand it but as important you also want to make sure that you understand, especially for this particular boilerplate, the language uh, or the, the color coding here. Uh, so you'll want to refresh your memory on that. And, and really a key to understand about this boilerplate is that green means examples. We're not saying that these should be your tactics. These are just example tactics that you could implement based on what we've learned at conferences this year. Some of these tactics have been around for years and years. It's just that they're coming back up at conferences again based on whatever threat vector that has everybody spooked at the time, right? So uh, these are just example strategy statements from the 2017 webinar. And so there's a movie on uh, Infotext.com shows you how to use strategy statements in your tactical plan analysis.
And so how about we uh, pause for just a second and go out and look to see where that movie is. When we go to movies.infotext.com um, and this one right here is from 2017. And so it really talks a lot about the strategy statements, how to develop a strategy statement, you know, that you need to take a top-down approach, a bottom-up approach. Um, they may change from year to year. Uh, you may have a strategy statement in year one that surfaces again in year four. Uh, but what we're really trying to do is we're trying to say, out of everything that we could do, these are the top strategies that we're trying to execute in order to make sure that technology is aligned with the mission and the strategy of the bank. What this is then is this is just where we're putting example strategy statements. Really, they need to be green, right? They're, they're examples. And we should have probably done that when we were getting ready for this. Again, our boilerplates are simply starting points. They're not perfect. This is a proposed example IT strategy for the year 2017. We didn't update this since 2017. Um, notice that, you know, we've got a little bit of, you know, some metrics up here as well that we might document. But in this particular proposal, what we're saying is that this bank is going to define as their vision statement. And so it's feasible that for several years now, this bank has been looking at reliability, safety, and late majority adoption as their overall vision. We're, we're, we want to make sure that our systems are always available. We want to make sure we're protecting confidentiality and integrity. And one of the ways we're going to do that is we're not going to care if other people beat us to the market for particular technologies. We're going to be a late majority adopter. We're going to wait until half the banks adopt something before we adopt it ourselves. But suffice it to say, I'd like to direct your attention to a meta strategy here. And what I mean by this is I am seeing some of our clients now um, say, all right, if you want me to bullet point seven bullet points on, you know, what our strategy is going to be for 2020, I just want you to know we're being examined in 2020. And management always comes around, you know, we take that top down, bottom up approach. And so the bottom up part sometimes comes back to, you know, change their mind after six months or after three months or whatever. So we have some of our clients leaving placeholders that out of all the seven things we're going to try to accomplish, you know, these are the f top five we're accomplishing in 2020. And we also have an exam coming up. We want to leave plenty of space on our calendar to be able to properly respond to our exam or our audit. And let's face it, management's going to come up to us after they go to that conference in May that they always go to and come back with a lot of really good ideas. And we want to be able to respond to them and to really facilitate their newer ideas without it causing a problem on our ability to achieve these five strategy statements here. And so we're actually going to have two of our seven strategy statements be placeholders. Well, what this is all about is prioritizing what we're going to do so that we do have the time, maybe not to get everything done, but to get the most important things done. And so having placeholders allows us to say no. You know, we're only going to try to achieve five things this year because we need to leave time on our calendar to do a good job of responding to risk as it's discovered and competitiveness as it's presented. So now we are ready to, you know, get to the tactics that we've kind of gathered from the 2019 uh, Cyber Fraud and Physical Conference. Uh, but let me first show you that this is kind of an example here of how the whole spreadsheet works. And I'm going to kind of talk to you and walk you through this a little bit more so you don't have to go back and find it in other movies, right? But suffice it to say, I want you to know that what's kind of neat about this is that it also includes 2018 and 2017. So if you're new to this, if you haven't been coming to this webinar every year and grabbing our new ideas and pulling them into your, you know, new tactics analysis methodology, because, you know, I, I've had clients say, hey, you know what, we don't use a spreadsheet. We have a ticketing system we use, but we always grab these three columns because we love these ideas. We, we appreciate you tracking them, and that's cool, all right? But if you haven't been doing that every year, you can actually go back and see what we learned in 2017, what we learned in 2018. Uh, but this right here is just from the Cyber Fraud Conference. 
And so, again, some of you might, the reason why you're at the webinar is because you want this information, you know, and you're just going to copy the, the project name, you know, where it came from, and a description. And I totally get that. All right. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to walk the rest of us through how this spreadsheet works real quick. And so um, let's go ahead and, and get started on that not so easy endeavor. Uh, the spreadsheet, it, it might look a little complex, but it's really not as intimidating as it looks on, on the surface here. And, and just so you know, I'm going to kind of zoom in a little bit more. I had 100%. It, it fits, you know, nicely. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, the, the top part of this spreadsheet is more to show you how to use things like quote estimates and that sort of thing. We don't have any of that stuff down here. Um, I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit again. You know, 100% for me at least uh, can show the whole spreadsheet. But what I want you to see is that, you know, we have the 2019 uh, tactics, and then we kind of have the 2018 and 2017, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's in red, we're saying you should customize to your own bank, um, meaning that, you know, if, if, if this, this might be what you call it in your bank, but... You know, you should take a look at everything in red and make sure that this applies to your bank. I want you to also know that a lot of clients have, I've seen nuke these two rows immediately. They, they, don't, they don't care what governance category it's in or, you know, they don't want to get phasey on it. They, they don't want to have to be thinking, well, what phase of the design process are we in on? And, um, but if you watched the 2017 and 2018 webinar, uh, you'll see that I... I basically said that what we're really doing is we're going through a design process. We're in an analysis phase with this spreadsheet. This is not what we want to present to our board. We don't want to, you know, have management have to decipher this spreadsheet. This is how we organize all of the input into what we could do in 2020 so that we can select from that in the second phase of the process and then formalize some kind of an approval and that's when management needs to get involved, and that's when we certainly shouldn't be presenting spreadsheets. That's when really we're going to present, you know, the strategy documents. That's when we're going to present the strategy that also calls for a tactical plan. Anyway, we don't want management to have to decipher a spreadsheet that's intimidating us the first time we see it. Um, and then by the time we're in implementation, maybe you're working off this spreadsheet, maybe not. You know, again, it's a sloppy living and breathing process planning is. And, and really, all we're trying to do is we're trying to become aware of when we're not working according to our best laid plans. And so the first, you know, column here is just the number. So a lot of times it's a lot easier to refer to the number of a particular tactic. But, you know, these are all alternative tactics. If you nuke out the ones you don't want to use, eventually you might, you might end up having a, a handful of, of, of 30 tactics that implement your seven strategy statements. If you have a tactic, by the way, that you can't really align to a strategy statement, maybe that's a tactic for a future year, or maybe your strategy isn't really what your strategy is. The relative return is just a, a, a calculation that we tried to put together uh, using some columns that I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, percent completion might be something that you want to track throughout the year, um, but who is it assigned to? I think that's very, very important. Uh, by the way, another thing I think is very important is a deadline, but since this is a tactical analysis, we're not really assigning deadlines yet. What we really want to do is we want to measure the relative return of our tactics and then prioritize what we're going to do based on that relative return. And so this is just a method of doing that. And it's a method of allowing us to say, hey, the reason why we're not going to do great idea number of 672 that management team X brought back from the you know wild conference they got drunk at in Chicago is because the relative return on that is substantially lower than the relative returns on the ideas that George brought back from New Orleans. And then, you know, by prioritizing our tactics, we can determine which ones we're going to commit to this year, and then we move that into our ticketing system, our change management spreadsheet or whatever we use to prioritize and track our objectives. We need to give our tactics a name. Again, we can refer to them by number, but when we're in the you know, break room and we start saying, hey, you know, uh, that one thing that we were talking about in that one meeting that we didn't name, 
You mean Metasploit? Yeah, Metasploit. Well, let's give it a name, right? Let's give it a name now. Um, the source of the idea, uh, you know, I mean, this is really helpful, in my opinion, in a bank when you can say, well, that's what the president brought back from the conference versus that's what the teller brought back from the conference, you know, that teller that started two months before the conference, even though I wouldn't want to ignore the teller's idea, either, but maybe at least we know that, you know, we can justify which ideas we're actually implementing, not by whether they're a president or a teller but by the relative return that we've calculated in our tactical analysis. Meanwhile, what's the most relevant strategy statement? So this is where we're really trying to tie it back to here. We use safety across the board for this one, and it's not even a strategy statement. It's a vision statement, but we're okay with that. We're okay with you aligning to your vision as well as your strategy. Your vision is this is what we always want to do. Your strategy is this is what we're going to focus on next year. And so these tactics could relate to your vision or your strategy. But we want to try to get our arms around each of the tactics. Uh, now, if it looks like the relative return is already low, well, then maybe we don't spend as much time looking up the cost and that sort of thing. But this is where we're actually doing the analysis of the tactic to try to figure out what the relative return is on the tactic. Cost estimates, cost quotes. You know, if it's an estimate, we're putting it in gray. If it's a quote, we're putting it in black. This is very, very helpful because, again, we don't want to spend more time on this than we have to, right? If we overheard someone saying, yeah, it cost me about eight grand to get something done, well, hey, let's go ahead and put that in as a worst-case scenario and then maybe circle back around once we see it. Hey, the relative return on this is heading kind of higher than we thought it was going to. Let's take a solid quote. In this particular case, a solid quote came out Less than what Dan said it was going to be. And by the way, that's all fake, right? Um, examples. These are all examples. But now we're getting, when we get to this column, we're getting to our effort to prioritize. The relative return is based on these three columns that Infotech started thinking, what kind of metrics can we apply towards potential tactics to help us measure whether we ought to do them or not? We've kind of decided that we ought to wait the potential worst case scenario cost um, and a scale of one to five. But if it doesn't cost us anything that doesn't take any time, then it's a five, right? That's a good thing from a cost perspective, right? But if it's uh, pretty expensive financially, you know, it could be a one. If it's, if it's not that expensive financially, but man, is it going to take a lot of time to get off the ground? Maybe that's a two. Now, you're, you might want to document your guidelines as you go. This is very much like a risk assessment where, you know, we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner. We, we want to break rules that we define as we're going through and, and analyzing this, right? Because, you know, sometimes on a scale of one to five, something might be a negative two. It's so darn costly. And you just, you don't even want to touch it. It's just way too costly. The point is, is we want to make sure that we're doing a good job of documenting our thinking so that if somebody ever asks us, well, you know, I see you didn't execute my great idea that I brought back from the Wild Conference in Chicago. Why was that? Was it because I was drunk when I sent you the email about it? Well, no, it was because it was going to cost us on a scale of one to five, you know, it was going to cost us, you know, a lot more than we, you know, originally thought. So we gave it a one and blah, blah, blah. All right. And so cost, this is a subjective number. It's an estimate. But it's a way for us to try to prioritize and weight the cost of a tactic into our decision-making process when it comes to, again, the most important column in this, the relative return of the tactic. Meanwhile, what's the benefits to the customer? Or I've had some people say, that really shouldn't be benefits to the customer. It should be benefits to the strategy. We might even want to change that. We might even want this to say benefits to the customer or strategy. And then I never did change it, so let me do that now. You see how these boiler points are just starting points? These numbers, this was just us working with the client saying, hey, what do you think of this approach? And it's been working over time, but you might customize this to your own situation. You might say, hey, 
you know, I want this to be on a scale of one to four. I agree with Dan that the, the benefit isn't as important in our bank as the cost, but it's almost as important as the cost. And Dan's saying it's only three-fifths as important. I'm saying it's four-fifths, right? Meanwhile, risk management. If it increases risk, we shouldn't get any credit. And if it's neutral, hey, then we don't need to worry about it. And so that's why we came up with the 210 here. Now, I've actually audited a client that adopted this, and they actually added this into their metric. And they basically said if it's very urgent, then it's a 3, and if it's medium or low, it's a 1. And then what they did is they just added this cell right over to here. And that, I, I loved it because what they decided is that urgency matters too. If we've got a situation where, yeah, it's going to reduce risk that addresses an imminent threat like ransomware, we want to do that this year. Urgency should factor into our relative return. And so it's just a matter of changing the spreadsheet to meet your own analytical priorities. And then finally on the way right here is just where what we've done is we put instructions. They're in blue, right? So there are instructions to you. But let us spend the rest of our time together here talking about what we learned at the Cyber Fraud Physical Conference. So, boy, as you can tell my, from my voice, by the way, I'm still kind of hung over from that conference. Um, this was the first year that we merged the Physical Security Conference that the Indiana Bankers Association normally hosts in March with the Cyber Security Conference that the IBA normally hosts in October. Um, I was the moderator of the Cyber Conference and Jim Reckel was the moderator of the Physical Security Conference. And we decided that, you know what? In reality, physical and IT needs to collaborate, and they need to do it now or else we've got issues. And why not do that with our conference? And boy, did the conference end up proving that to be a good idea. So what we did is, as I was watching these talks, I documented which talk I was watching, and what idea came from the talk. Metasploit's been around for years and years and years, but hey, it might be time for us to find somebody on our team that can learn Metasploit and start using it to learn how we can be attacked, right? So we're starting to get to a level of maturity where we ought to start doing our own testing of our own systems, even though we've got auditors and MSSPs and all these other great partners helping us secure our systems. So what I'm going to do with the rest of this section of the webinar is I'm going to walk you through the talks that I was able to get action items out of, um, starting with the talk that Jim and I presented to start the conference. We did have an FBI agent, Steve Secor, came in and gave a great talk. I, I, uh, I did not get to see this talk. I was really bummed because I really am interested in PSIMs is what I call them, Physical Security Information Monitoring Systems, and uh, or... or, or does it stand for Physical Security Incident Monitoring Systems? I'm not exactly sure because I didn't get to go see the talk, uh, but I do feel like all of us who are working on our IT plan might decide to add as a tactic for next year that we look into PSIMs, okay? And so anyway, I don't want to, you know, I'm going to kind of walk through a few highlights here real quick, uh, but we um, had a guy from BKD talk about um, uh, identity access management um, we also had Brian Petzold from uh, Betel Security uh, really kind of expand our thinking a little bit about endpoint security protection. I really uh, got a lot of, you know, takeaways there. Of course, Tom Williams and Alan Eves from Jack Henry just really did a great job of walking us through an insider threat um, incident that, that proved that physical security needs to be involved in the incident response process. Um, these are some ideas from other conferences. Uh, David Anderson. And so the early bird talk at the beginning of day two, and, and when we contacted David, he said, my talk's expanding. It's now two hours long. And we said, we well, only have an hour. It's an early bird. We, we can't get people to get up at, you know, six in the morning, you know. So he came in and he gave as best as he could, you know, and it really turned out about half of his talk. But boy, was it a good talk anyway. We, we wrote down a lot of action items from that talk. And then we had a talk about human trafficking. There's some action items there. Molly Ernst from, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the law firm, but boy, she gave a really good talk on, uh, you know, the legal aspects of cyber breaches. Uh, Steve Stasiakonis 
uh, came in and he first gave a breakout talk where the takeaways are rather technical. And then he gave a talk about social engineering for the General Assembly at lunch. Um, and then finally, uh, we actually had a uh, company come in and give a an active shooter demonstration. It was more of a training demonstration than it was an exercise. Um, it's not like they pretend we pretended like there's an active shooter. But boy, did we learn a lot. It was a very powerful talk. Um, I'm really proud of the input that the committee members, uh, both on the, the fraud and the physical and the cyber side, uh, they're the ones that always make this conference so good because they let us know what people need to hear about. But my point being is that we have a lot of tactics here that are really questions. And um, I noticed that throughout the whole conversation that the conference became is that it was more, wow, these are great talks, but they're raising questions that we need to go back to the bank and answer. Um, as you're going through these, please know that these are not tactics that the speakers suggested. Show videos from Dan and Jim's trend talk to management. We didn't say that in our talk. I'm interpreting from the talk that maybe it'd be a good idea for you to consider trend talk videos in your management awareness training. And so we included the URLs for them over here. But my point being is that these are my interpretation when Brian was giving a talk on endpoint security, a holistic approach to endpoint security, he was talking about how application whitelisting is really going to be a very important control somewhere down the road. And so my interpretation of that is let's begin the process of implementing application whitelisting. Where, where should we start? You see how that's kind of more of a question than it is an answer? I mean, it is a question, right? Um, but we should be asking these questions as a tactic to improve upon our strategy or our vision of safety. I hope this is ringing a bell to you. So something that I did want to bring up from the conference uh, because I have some consternation about the whole notion of banks being in compliance with state law. At least here in Indiana and in Ohio, the state law has an exemption that says if you're a bank and you're complying with federal regulations, that you do not have to follow the state law, um, especially when it comes to notifying a state's attorney general's office, especially when it comes to the time restrictions that the state puts on the incident response process. And as a bank, we want to leverage that. I mean, this is the one area, well, I mean, there might be more areas, but this is an area where having to comply with all these guidances helps the bank because we don't want to have to deal with, you know, I mean, notifying the state's attorney general's office if we don't have to. Um, we certainly don't want to have time restrictions on our response process. So I also want to make sure I stress that the quicker we notify our customers, the better we handle reputational risk. And yet if we notify customers before we have our arms around all the information, we're really taking a lot of reputational risk, not to mention security risk. What I'm saying, though, is, is that the questions were about state laws that we may or may not have to follow. Now, there's a lot of really good tactics that came out of here, starting with the fact that as soon as we can, I feel like we ought to identify the states where we have customers. And who knows, maybe it's all 50 states, maybe not, I don't know. But if we don't have any customers from Alaska, we don't have to research the Alaska law. And then I feel like, you know, the next step from that is to try to figure out, does this state have an exemption? And if it does, let's inventory that. Now, the other thing that I really like that came out of this, it's something that we've been starting to trip on ever since uh, when we did an incident response test, I think it was about 2015 or so, uh, one of the board members, they brought a board member on. We asked if they could bring a board member, and he just happened to be a lawyer. And boy, did we learn a lot from him being there. And so we've been recommending our clients put their lawyer on the incident response team if they can afford to do so or if they want to spare the time. Um, and the main reason why, in my opinion, is twofold. Number one, let's make sure we get to the bottom of Dan's claims about the exemption for banks when it comes to state law. Your lawyer should be looking into that before we're all in a panic, not after there's an incident. And so what we're finding is having your attorney participate in the incident response test is definitely worth the five or $600 you're going to have to pay him 
to be there. And by the way, but um, he might need to spend a couple hours getting prepared for it as well. And, and then finally, I'm sorry I said he. I should have said he or she. After all, the really good lawyer that gave a really good talk was Molly. I also wanted to point out um, that uh, uh, there were, you know, 60 some, you know, tactics this time. So who knows, you know, how much time I was able to apply to each tactic. But whenever possible, I would try to research the tactic. Um, you know, one good example of that was um, a tactical idea that came out of David Anderson's talk was to monitor exploit DB, which is a website that really helps us understand the exploits against applications we use. And so I was thinking the geekier amongst us, the, the more technical amongst us, might find that to be a good idea. Um, I decided I wanted to kind of go out there and see what it looked like, and I just wanted to make sure you know that I couldn't get there. My, my um, uh, layers of endpoint security is blocking me from going to that website. So uh, you might want to talk to somebody that knows what they're doing before you try to go to that website. Um, I decided to leave it in as a tactic. I guess the last thing I have to say, you know, is that, um, well, that uh, for this particular talk, um, uh, Rich kept saying we should gather metrics for identity access management, but I, he never did get around and actually kind of delineate those metrics. And I didn't realize that or I would have asked him during the talk. But as I was going through my notes, I realized that, you know, hey, um, maybe we ought to provide a list of metrics that we should start gathering for identity access management. So I, I just wanted you to know, it's, it basically says, while Rich didn't offer any examples, this is what Infotex would suggest at this point. Um, we are not IAM experts. Um, quite frankly, I just Googled around for about 20, 30 minutes, and then I came back saying, hmm, this looks like of what I would be looking for if I was wanting to implement identity access management in a bank. Um, doesn't mean that this is exactly what you should be looking for. Again, you should always customize all of this stuff back to your bank. Uh, but then also you'll see stuff like here um, where I'm adding in my own two cents. I'm sorry, but you know, I, we don't believe in single sign off uh, or single sign on. I should say um, single sign off. If you can do that, I don't know. I think that's a great idea, right? Um, you know, log out of everything all at once if you think you have ransomware. But single sign-on, it's, it's destroying the advantage that we have of layered security. That if, that if somebody gets our network password, they can't use that to log into the core. And so what we're doing is we're just totally blowing that away. And, what, what I'm, and now I'm starting to sound whiny. But what bothers me about that is that at the same time people are talking about single sign-on, they're also talking about the expense and time that we have to go through to implement network segmentation. You know, let's let's back away from the trees to see the forest here. We're smaller community-based banks. We don't need single sign-on. We're not dealing with 20,000 users. We can continue to require our employees to sign on to each individual application individually. And I feel like taking your shoes off in the airport is a lot less valuable as a control than logging in and using a password into an application. I hope you all enjoyed that presentation. I, I apologize. I know you're going to feel like you're kind of trapped into a spreadsheet like Joe and Jane here for a while. Uh, but suffice it to say, it does lay a good paper trail. It helps deliver, deliver on all of the guidance points. Um, your auditors will be really impressed if you're using a tactical plan analysis uh, like we just showed you. And so, Michael, are there any questions? Yeah, Dan, there actually are a couple of questions. The first one is, is the IT operations plan actually required in the guidance? Um, yes, uh, that is a good question. Um, in the FFIEC guidance summary, you'll see what the guidance says about that IT operational plan. And you'll see it doesn't really say a lot about it, um, which is nice. It leaves plenty of flexibility. But yes, if you're a larger bank or if you're a bank that wants to go ahead and develop that operational plan for each of your tactics, um, that, that Word document, that, this Word document here, um, has everything you need 
it, it includes everything that the FFIEC happened to say about that. So, um, good question. Any other questions, Michael? Two more questions. The next one is, the tactics that are identified as InfoTech's basic controls in our spreadsheet, what are those again? Um, yes, the, the InfoTech's basic controls are... Um, what they are is, is, is a combination of things. They, they might just be something that we feel like we ought to push because a lot of banks aren't doing it. Um, it could be a control that we picked up uh, while we were, you know, at a, at a different conference than the conference, you know, that, that we're articulating here. Um, it certainly isn't a, an academically created list of you. You have to have this control, and it's more of a suggestion something for you to think about and um, and again it's it, it's actually not in the um, you know the the tactical pay and alternative tab those basic controls are in the last tab in the spreadsheet there so I hope that answered the question any other questions Michael so the last question I think I can answer where can I find this change management movie so I'm going to have Sophia put a link up on the screen and that's where you can find the movie all right, great. Well, um, uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, this year and uh, just put it on your calendar next October after the conference. Uh, we'll be doing this again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And before we end this webinar, I'd just like to say thanks for joining us and please take a moment to fill out our quick evaluation to tell us how we're doing or let us know about topics you would like us to cover. When you view an Infotech's webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you're agreeing to the terms posted at the web page listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotech's presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotech's webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotech's reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in this slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the web page shown on this slide.